Hello, welcome to the Nerve Centre of Plymouth at War and Peace. We recently visited the 35th International Shipwreck Conference at Plymouth University. It was there we spoke all things submarines and Jutland wrecks with the nautical archaeologist, historian, author, speaker and television contributor, Dr Innes McCartney. Hello Innes, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? So Innes, we've recently noticed uh, on social media that you've been surveying wrecks at Scapa Flow. What work did that entail? Well, we brought two survey ships um, to the flow, the big one that works 24-7 and mm. a, a little one that does um, the inshore areas, both equipped with high-resolution multi-beam. And we ran both systems for over a week. We mapped um, about 40 square kilometres of the seabed, nearly 600 miles of run lines. Uh, very detailed, very slow, very methodical work, which has given us a huge data set, which we'll be working on for the next year or so. Anything interesting that you can mention now? or? Uh, well, I mean, the thing I would say is that the resolution we've been getting with the multi-beam has been um, tremendous. We're looking at five centimetres or less resolution on the larger wrecks. And in the shallow areas, we're looking at wreckage where we can basically count the rivets. Amazing. Absolutely. So the, the data looks absolutely tremendous. Ines, you of course are no stranger to the shipwrecks of Jutland. And in 2015, as we know, you embarked on what would become the most comprehensive survey of the Jutland conflict archaeology ever undertaken. Along with the survey team, you discovered the exact locations and fates that befell all but two of the 25 Jutland wrecks. Was this the pinnacle of your career so far? Um, oh, I don't know about that. I, I mean, Jutland's one of um, a, a number of areas of interest over a lot of years. I mean, I think the 2015 survey was was interesting because we covered so much ground. Um, but I think we probably crowned that uh, in 2016 when we went back and we, we found the last two warships we were missing that were in the battlefield. And we also picked out HMS Warrior, which sunk on its return. So by last August, we had located and surveyed all of the ships on Kajutland and um, that's that's very been very rewarding and uh, it's certainly up there with uh, the things I've done over the years that I'm most proud of. You and survey team happened upon the uh, T-class submarine HMS Tarpon. Uh, how was how was she discovered? How was she stumbled upon? Well I was doing um, I was compiling a database of uh, likely shipwrecks we would find off the west coast of Denmark in the various survey areas we had planned and, and Tarpon was in there so I think it was in the um, the survey at the beginning of last year, March, where when we left um, Tubron, we were heading out um, the westerly direction. Um, and I, I mentioned to the survey team that there was the possibility that we might come across Tarpon. Um, the, the, the problem with a lot of the submarines that sunk at that time in that area is that the exact cause of their loss has quite often not been established, particularly if it's thought they've been mined. Um, but with Tarpon, um, it was pretty certain what had happened to it. And that gave us a position in which to search. Um, and in fact, you know, we, we, we came across the, uh, the wreck of the submarine quite quickly. So Innes, um, you've been uh, vocal on social media and in the press highlighting the illegal salvage and destruction of historic shipwrecks, particularly uh, the Jutland wrecks. You have seen firsthand the damaging results that uh, illegal salvage can do. Can you give us an example that particularly got your blood boiling? Well, I could give you several, um, but um, one that does come to mind, uh, and I often think of, is um, relates to a uh, British destroyer, um, HMS Tipperary, um, which sunk at Jutland, the 150 of the crew killed. Um, the base of the ship burned to the waterline at night, and it was, the description of it is quite awful. Well, yes, yeah. um, and um, when we came across that site in 2015 um, with multi-beam and ROV. What the multi-beam image showed was that the entire engine room was just been taken out with a grab and uh, um, this just left a crater in the seabed. And, you know, I just questioned the mindset of individuals that could act in such a disrespectful way. And I found it, you know, quite, quite surprising. So we know the British government are reviewing uh, the UNESCO uh, convention on the protection of underwater cultural heritage with a view to um, pursuing ratification. When do you think this will happen? And in your opinion, will it make any difference to preventing the illegal salvage of shipwrecks? Well, I mean, it's an interesting one. Um, the, the government have given an undertaking that they're going to look at UNESCO again. There's going to be an announcement next month, um, which is all very nice, but we've been down this road before, so I, I wouldn't say that I'm 
overexcited at the moment. I mean, I really do do hope we, we have some traction this time, but I guess time will tell. And do you think there's anything they can do to stop them, really? Well, yeah, I mean, this is the argument that's been put forward in the past for not um, ratifying UNESCO, but it isn't um, one, I think, which can be sustained for much longer, um, primarily because the British taxpayer, many people don't know this, um, was actually partly funded to the tune of £200 million. A, um, a company called um, Satellite Applications Catapult, based in uh, Oxfordshire, and they've had money from other, uh, match funding from other places as well. They are now tracking the movement of every single fishing trawler at sea, anywhere in the world, right. using its AIS and its VLS. Yeah. And the system is automatic. So in the event that the fishing boat decides he wants to do something illegal, he's going to turn off his AIS. At that moment, the vessel is then instantly tracked using the satellite radar net. Right. Um, this system is in its infancy, but has been successfully used to um, catch illegal trawling off Pitcairn, right. off Ascension Island. Um, so even in the remote places of the earth, illegal activity can now be monitored and um, the boys in blue can be waiting when yeah. they try to land something they shouldn't have. Now, this company tell me that um, tracking salvage ships in the same way is easy because they're doing effectively behaving in pretty much the same way as trawlers um, and there isn't any reason why they shouldn't be doing it. And in fact, they have cracked on that um, for a couple of states' governments, they are monitoring certain sensitive sites with this technology. So what this means, ultimately, is that the resourcing argument um, holds no water anymore. Sorry for the cheap pun there. but um, and, and so that um, the, the International Convention, when it is ratified by countries around the world, brings a legislative, a legislative flame, playing field which is flat. Um, we all play to the same rules, and um, you know, slowly, we, slowly, the possibility is now there that we can eradicate this scourge from our yeah. cultural heritage. Um, we know HMS Exeter was a, a Plymouth-built warship, um, and sunk in the Java Sea in World War Two. Do you think the reports of her complete salvage, she's completely gone, are exaggerated? Um, we've seen pictures in the newspaper uh, of just an empty crater, if you like, where she was. Um, do you think there's anything left of her? Well, I haven't seen that much more. Say some, but not that much more data than has been in the newspapers. Um, and from what I've seen and from um, those that I've spoken to, um, it appears that it pretty much has completely disappeared. You've discovered, dived, um, surveyed many shipwrecks all around the world. Um, which one was your particular favourite and why? <laughs> That's impossible to say. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, uh, um, I mean, I, you know, there's... Uh, when I first started to um, research lost vessels, particularly submarines, and um, and realised that we had the capability as divers to to start um, you know, finding and identifying some of these, that was tremendously exciting. So the, the first few years of doing that will always um, you know, be very high in my memory. But there have been highlights. I mean, a comet that strikes me is another one which we did with diving. All the things that Chuck learned, M1, of course. I mean, there, there have been many. And I, I wouldn't really want to pick one out as being any more no. special others. At the time, every time you do one, it's just it's that exciting. And then you, know, you go to the next. Yeah, my, my particular favourite was um, a few years ago when I first uh, came across you on the Discovery Channel, for instance, and it was a, uh, a German U-boat that had a special uh, protective skin over it. Yeah, that was, uh, that was U-480. Yeah. And um, it's been subject now to two television documentaries. And um, that was the first. That was, yeah. that was the first U-boat I ever identified. So... Um, in uh, in that regard, I suppose it's it's the one I I think about more than any other. When you're not working in the world of shipwrecks, surveying, or writing books, there like your Jutland uh, 1916 book, and um, doing speaking like you are today at the uh, International Shipwreck Conference, and your variety of TV work, um, what's your guilty pleasure? I don't know. I play my guitar at home pretty yeah. badly. Um, I like watching cricket. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> those, those are the those are the uh, the, the two things I do when I'm, know, I'm not doing this. But I, you know, this is this isn't a job for me. This is a life, so it's it's pretty much twenty four seven. What's next for this McCarthy? Well, I, I think uh, the next eighteen months um, is going to be pretty much tied up uh, going through the data set of the last survey. Um, there's kind of other irons in the fire that I can't really mention, but uh, I'm, I'm busy with World War One until basically the, uh, the centenary runs out. Submarine wrecks or shipwrecks? Submarines. World War One or World War Two nautical archaeology? World War One. And diving or cricket? <laughs> uh, both, because you have to have balance. 
Great. That's a, that's a fair answer. Fair answer. And it's McCartney. Like, thank you ever so much for being with us today on Plymouth at War. I really appreciate no your time.